Welcome to the Heat Pump Nation and our video about designing heat pump installations for heating and cooling. Hi, I'm Jonathan and I'm a contractor specializing in heat pumps. For this video, I've teamed up with my friends at Franklin Energy to talk about how to design heat pump installations that make customers more comfortable while saving the most energy possible. This video was originally produced for the Comfortable Home Rebates Program of Pacific Gas and Electric, with production support from Daikin, a leading manufacturer of heat pumps. If you don't know about Daikin and their many heat pump products, check out DaikinAC.com. In an earlier video, we talked about how to grow a heat pump business through marketing and lead generation, which included things like networking with utilities and other groups that advocate for heat pumps. It also included tips on how to generate leads from the home improvement marketplace and targeting customers who want new, better, and different technologies for their home. In this video, we shift gears and talk about how to design installations that deliver the energy savings that utilities and other groups want while ensuring that homeowners get the best possible comfort. In short, this video will help you deliver upon the claim that modern variable capacity heat pumps can produce more comfort for less money. I want to begin by talking about how heating and air conditioning installations are designed today. Then look at how design differs when applying a modern variable capacity heat pump. I'll also share some tips and fails around designing an installation that I've learned from my many years of heat pump contracting. So let's get started. For most contractors, residential heating design typically relies on using a gas furnace or other fossil fueled equipment. And given this choice of fuel and equipment, I suspect you're probably used to designing an installation in a typical way, such as selecting equipment that can supply enough heat on the coldest day of the year with some amount of additional capacities to spare. This way, if the homeowner uses a setback temperature either at night or during the unoccupied daytime hours, the heating system will have excess capacity available to quickly recover the home to a comfortable temperature. Having some reasonable excess capacity is part of the typical heating design strategy, and it works well with furnaces. Also, it doesn't cost very much to go up in size, for example, from a 60,000 BTU model to an 80,000 BTU model. So designing a furnace installation with excess capacity available both produces good results and adds very little additional cost for the customer. There is another typical design strategy that also results in the furnace having excess capacity. Have you ever designed an installation where the cooling load was greater than the heating load? In these cases, the contractor is typically forced to select a furnace model for its blower capacity so that the AC will receive its needed airflow. For example, I regularly had to select a 100,000 BTU model furnace because it had a sufficient blower capacity for the 42,000 BTU cooling requirement even though the home I was installing in had a heating requirement less than 40,000 BTUs. In this case, the cooling requirement drove the furnace decision, not the heating requirement. It was an unfortunate situation that I had to deal with regularly. Newer homes were well insulated to reduce heating requirements, yet they often had lots of south-facing windows which drove up the summer cooling requirements. The manufacturer of the furnaces I was selling didn't offer a low-capacity furnace that could move enough system air to meet the AC requirement. At the time, I had no choice but to sell a grossly oversized furnace. If you want to sell a modern variable capacity heat pump system instead of a gas furnace and AC, you will need to design differently than you have in the past for two reasons. Number one, it turns out that modern variable capacity heat pumps are more energy efficient when you do not use a setback at night or during the unoccupied hours. 
At my company, we advise our customers to set it and forget it, or find the temperature setting that is comfortable and leave it alone. This allows the computer inside the variable capacity heat pump to self-regulate its operations so that the least amount of energy is consumed. And the computer does a great job. If a homeowner wants to change the temperature for their own comfort, we recommend a setback of no more than 3 degrees. If the setback is more than 3 degrees, the system will use more energy trying to recover the temperature and thermal mass of the structure than is saved by the setback temperature. A recent research project reported these findings, and you can rely on this new information. The second reason you will need to design a heating system differently when using a modern variable capacity heat pump is that heat pumps are just not as powerful as fossil-fueled equipment. So, if you keep adding heating capacity to the structure by installing more heat pumps, you will spend a lot of money. For example, residential natural gas furnaces are available in 120,000 BTU models. Yet the largest capacity heat pump available in single phase power are 60,000 BTUs. And while it is possible, or even desirable in some cases, to use multiple heat pump systems in a home, the design goal should be to minimize the amount of heat pump capacity that you are applying to only what is needed. Since we are not designing for setbacks, we really only need to design for what our load calculation calls for. And if we regularly sell more than what is needed, it is both wasteful and undermines the key value proposition that we sell heat pumps with, which is energy savings. So given that setbacks are not desirable and that heat pumps are not available in capacities as large as fossil fueled equipment, a different design strategy is required. Here is a four-step heat pump design process for the application of modern variable capacity heat pump systems. I regularly use this and have trained hundreds of heating and cooling salespeople to use it as well. Step one involves a load calculation. Always perform a load calculation on the structure. There are a few things going on here. Firstly, it's very likely that the home's current heating system was not properly sized in the first place. Therefore, it is bad practice to select your heat pump based on the heating capacity of the furnace you are replacing. Simply put, a like-for-like -like kind of thinking will not work when replacing a furnace with a heat pump. Secondly, over the years, many older homes have had some changes made to them which have affected the heating load, such as replacement windows, air sealing, and added insulation. All of these measures will have lowered the heating requirement, making the current furnace even more oversized. For these two reasons, it is critical that you perform a load calculation when replacing a furnace with a modern variable capacity heat pump. Step two involves evaluating the existing ductwork. If your heat pump design relies on reusing the existing ductwork system, always evaluate the ductwork for suitability to ensure it can handle enough system air. In some older homes, the original ductwork may be undersized for the airflow requirements of the new heat pump system. This is especially true if the home's cooling load is much lower than the heating load and the home originally had an oil furnace or early model gas furnace. If you are not sure how to evaluate the airflow capacity of a ductwork system, seek out this training. It will make you a better HVAC designer. If after you evaluate the ductwork, and its capacity is less than the heating requirement calls for, no problem. I have some tips to share that can help you out, and I'll cover these in a few minutes. For step three, look at the building envelope and try to identify simple and low-cost building envelope improvements. This can reduce your heating load requirements to the point where a heat pump can be easily applied. And you may find that with simple building envelope improvements, 
you can install a smaller capacity heat pump. A smaller capacity heat pump is advantageous for a couple of reasons. First, it will cost less for the homeowner to get into a heat pump, making the choice to convert to a heat pump easier. Secondly, smaller capacity heat pumps will use less energy when operating compared to their larger capacity cousins. Finally, in my experience, People who live in older homes and which are deficient in insulation know it, and they will welcome your offer to upgrade their home's insulation if you can wrap it into your heat pump sale. Remember, people struggle to find and hire good contractors, so make it easy for them to select you and your offer of a heat pump along with your offer for these other needed home improvements in the building envelope. The last step involves selecting the heat pump system. If you follow my four-step process, your equipment selection should be informed by a load calculation, should conform to the capabilities of the ductwork system, and may benefit from a reduced heating requirement through improvements to the building envelope. Before I advise you on selecting a heat pump, let's pause for a moment. You may have noticed that the four-step design process does not address the situation I mentioned earlier, when the cooling load is greater than the heating load. In this case, the cooling requirement would drive the equipment selection. After years of experience, I have not found any real difference in design strategy for those cases when the cooling requirement drives the equipment selection. Whether you are going to apply a single speed AC on a gas furnace or a modern variable capacity heat pump system, your equipment selection involves picking the model that will satisfy the cooling requirement. That's it. You would still want to apply the four step design process I suggested earlier, but after that, there are none of the special tips and fails to be mindful of, like there are when the heating requirement is greater and it drives the design. Let's dive into the tips and fails related to equipment selection and installation design. There are a few great tips I can share with you. These tips have produced successful heating system designs using a variable capacity heat pump, even in very cold climates. Assuming you have already followed the four-step design process we covered earlier, you will start with a reliable heating requirement and an understanding of any ductwork limitations. Now your job is to come up with an equipment selection and application that produces the best result for comfort and energy savings. Consider these steps. Number one, know your equipment options. Variable capacity heat pump systems come in a few different types. Your choice in the type of variable capacity heat pump should depend both on where you live and the design goals of the work you are doing. Here are several types of variable capacity heat pumps available to you. Which type or types you focus on selling should be an important consideration as you work to become an expert in modern variable capacity heat pumps. Number one, there are cold climate variable capacity heat pumps. This type of heat pump is available under a variety of brand names that differ by manufacturer, but they have one thing in common. They are designed to produce 100% of the rated capacity when it is 5 degrees outside. All heat pumps are rated for their capacity at 47 degrees Fahrenheit. Cold climate heat pumps can produce this rated amount even at 5 degrees Fahrenheit. They also continue to operate at lower than 13 degrees Fahrenheit or even colder depending on the manufacturer. Like all heat pumps, the colder it gets outside, the output of the heat pump starts to decline. But unlike the basic models of variable capacity heat pumps, cold climate models are designed to maintain heat output as much as possible, even as the outdoor temperatures drop. Generally speaking, Cold climates are locations where more hours of the year are spent in heating operation than in cooling operation, and where winter design temperatures are 15 degrees Fahrenheit and lower. Therefore, cold climate heat pumps are specially designed for heating. 
Now, they can cool equally well, but they have additional features above the standard models that make them able to produce lots of heat even in very cold environments. If you live and work in a cold or very cold environment, you should be selling cold climate model heat pumps. If you live and work in an area that doesn't see very cold temperatures or an area in which cooling hours of operation exceed heating hours of operation, you likely do not need a cold climate model. Number two, there are multi-zone variable capacity heat pumps. Unlike typical split system AC and heat pumps, the multi-zone models can operate with two or more indoor units connected to a single outdoor unit. In some cases, your heating and cooling system design may benefit from using a single outdoor heat pump with two or more indoor units attached. In other cases, a pair of single zone split systems may achieve the design goals better. We will cover this kind of decision making shortly, but it's important to understand that you've got options. Number three, in addition to the choice of single zone or multi zone outdoor units, there are many styles of indoor units to choose from. With modern variable capacity heat pumps, the indoor units come in a variety of styles. Some indoor units connect to ductwork, some do not. There are some simple equipment combination rules to follow, and you can learn these rules in the manufacturer's training classes. Tip number two is to try using multiple heat pumps. Once you understand all of your equipment options, remember that you can use multiple heat pumps in your design. If the design you are working on has a heating requirement that exceeds the capabilities available from a single modern variable capacity heat pump, try using two heat pumps to meet the requirement. Using two systems is necessary when the structure has a relatively large heating or cooling requirement because there is simply no way to get enough BTUs in the home with a single system. Often using two smaller systems instead of one larger system can produce better results in terms of energy consumption and comfort. One typical scenario in which I regularly use two smaller systems instead of one larger system is in a branch style home where the ductwork at the end of the run leaves the bedrooms underserved and uncomfortable. Another typical scenario is in a multi-story home where the single system leaves the upstairs underserved and hot in the summer. In both of these examples, I install one powerful variable capacity heat pump connected to the original central ductwork system. I also apply a second system to handle the distant part of the house that was poorly served by the central ductwork. Of course, there will be some ductwork modifications and a new installation location must be made for the second system, but the results are fantastic and all of the homeowners I've done this for are very satisfied with the results. Most homes have hot spots and cold spots, so if you remove the uncomfortable part of the house from the original central system and service this area with a second heat pump, you accomplish two goals in one to fix the hot spots and cold spots while also providing the structure with all of the BTUs it needs through application of a heat pump. Tip number three, for the coldest days of the year, try a design that uses a secondary heating source along with the heat pump system to meet the total heating requirement. In any location, the extreme hot or cold days are very few in number. In fact, the standard HVAC design strategy suggests that we select equipment to satisfy 99% of the historical hourly average temperatures. The outliers, or 1% of the hottest hourly average readings and 1% of the coldest hourly average temperature readings, we just don't design for them. So what if the home had, say, a powerful gas or propane fireplace insert? What if the home had some other additional heating source? Couldn't we design around using that additional heating source to supplement the heat pump on the coldest days of the year? Sure. In fact, I've had great success doing just this. 
It involves instructing a homeowner to, on the coldest days of the year or at any other time they feel uncomfortable, to turn on their other heating source. I go on to explain that I could design their heat pump system differently, but it would cost a lot more and use much more energy. And without fail, the homeowner is agreeable to using their existing secondary heating sources when needed. Don't feel like you need to link these two systems with an elaborate control. However, you must have a thoughtful, educational conversation with the homeowner on what their job is, and I would also put your design in writing on the sales agreement. Something like, design includes the homeowner operating their fireplace insert when outdoor temperatures reach 20 degrees, or when they feel it is necessary for their comfort, or something like that. Tip number four, be prepared for empty nesters. When you pursue leads from the home improvement market, you will come across an interesting opportunity that I call the empty nester application. This is a surprisingly common scenario that I have experienced over the years when generating leads from the home improvement marketplace. It occurs when a couple lives alone in a home after the kids have grown up and moved out leaving much of the home unoccupied and unused. The customer is looking for a way to condition the rooms they use daily, such as the living room and kitchen and the master bedroom suite. The central system is usually in perfect working condition. However, the homeowners see a value in only conditioning the spaces they use and live in daily. In this application, the central system remains available for use on the coldest days of the year or when guests are visiting. I have found that this application is a perfect opportunity to install a two-zone, ductless-style heat pump system with one indoor unit in the master bedroom and one in the combined kitchen and family room. This new heat pump system takes over the great majority of the occupied spaces heating and cooling, which provides great comfort in these areas and leaves the central system available, perhaps set back 10 degrees or so for the times when it is needed. It's important to train the homeowner on their role in choosing when to turn on the central system, and as before, It's best to put into writing how the system has been designed to work and the role the homeowner plays. The empty nester application is a really nice way to gain a customer, make a sale, and save some energy. The key is to be ready to sell this application when the opportunity arises. Tip number five, the displacement heating technique. There is a specific technique for applying a ductless style variable capacity heat pump called the displacement technique. This technique has been used successfully in several parts of the country where relatively expensive sources of heat are common, such as fuel oil and electric resistance heating. How it works is, a ductless style variable capacity heat pump is installed in the main living area. This heat pump runs all heating season and is designed to take over 100% of the heating needs of the main living space, which it serves. Typically, it serves a combined living room, dining room, and kitchen area. The existing oil or electric system is retained and used as needed. Key to making this application work is selecting a unit that can satisfy the entire heating need for the main living area, and educating the homeowner so that they understand their role in knowing when and how to operate the original heating source. The displacement heating technique works beautifully, and it produces very satisfied customers. For contractors, it is a way to gain a new customer in a way that lets them try a modern variable capacity heat pump without spending a large sum of money to convert the entire home. Tip number six, the undersized ductwork scenario. This design strategy is used when applying a heat pump and the home's heating requirement exceeds what the duct system can handle. 
This situation can occur when working in an older home where the ductwork was designed for a low volume, high temperature style furnace. Compared to older furnaces, heat pumps typically use larger air volumes. In some older homes, the ductwork cannot handle all the system air we might like to put through it. Thankfully, most of the major brands of variable capacity heat pumps offer a solution. It involves choosing a brand that makes a multi-zone model that works with a multi-position air handler. One zone would make use of a multi-position air handler to replace the furnace. The capacity of this multi-position air handler would be selected to max out the capacity of the ductwork. The remaining heating requirement that couldn't fit through the ductwork system is distributed by a second zone on the heat pump using a ductless style indoor unit. This second zone would be located in a location in the home that is either underserved by the ductwork system or in a part of the home that would experience the greatest heat loss, like a big room with a lot of windows. In this design strategy, the two indoor units work simultaneously over top of one another to condition the home. Don't think of this strategy as two discrete zones, but instead, two heat pumps working together on the same air volume. I have used this design strategy many times over the years, and it works great because the market I work in has mild summers and winters, and because I worked at a heating company with thousands of oil furnace customers, I often applied variable capacity heat pumps in homes that had a four-ton heating requirement but a ductwork system that could only handle three tons of air or less. Thankfully, the brand of variable capacity heat pumps that I was selling had a great four-ton heat pump, and I could put a three-ton air handler in place of the furnace and a single-zone ductless-style indoor unit somewhere else in the home. Now let's take a look at some installation fails that I have experienced and that I hope I can prevent you from making. Installation fail number one is what I call relying on guesswork. An easy way to make a heat pump design turn out poorly involves relying on guesswork. I'm not suggesting you need to get overly scientific in your heat pump design, but for example, not doing a load calculation is a risk and so is neglecting to evaluate the ductwork to see if it can handle the max airflow of the heat pump. The most common guesswork I see is when the salesperson fails to look up the actual performance data of the heat pump and instead uses the nominal capacity to select the model to use. This is a very common fail because the actual performance data for variable capacity heat pumps is not always easy to find and often requires some surfing the web. Remember, these are variable capacity heat pumps and the capacities vary depending on outdoor temperature. The named or nominal capacity never seems to reflect the actual output capacity of the heat pump at your design temperature. For example, Daikin makes a really powerful heat pump with a model name FTQ30. The model name suggests that the capacity of the heat pump is 30,000 BTUs. In reality, this heat pump can produce 55,000 BTUs at 47 degrees, 52,000 BTUs at 17 degrees, and 45,000 BTUs at 5 degrees. See what I mean? This model's actual performance data shows its output is at least 50% more than the nominal capacity. At my company, our solution is to produce a table of data for our salespeople to use. It contains the performance data for every heat pump we sell. We list the maximum output capacity and the minimum output capacity at 47 degrees, at 17 degrees, and at 5 degrees. I stop at 5 degrees because we never get that cold anywhere we install. 
In your market, it may make sense to go down to negative 13 degrees or whatever the equipment model's minimum performance goes to. There is really no limit to the number of ways a heating and cooling salesperson can rely on guesswork. In short, if you don't put your eyes on all of the many factors that can screw up your design, you are relying on guesswork, or even possibly being neglectful. Don't be that kind of HVAC designer. Instead, be the kind of HVAC designer that makes every heat pump installation a home run for the customer and for your company. Fail number two is what I call opening Pandora's box. Remember earlier when I mentioned that variable capacity heat pumps come in a few types and that there are lots of styles of indoor units to choose from? One of the fails I have personally made, and I see it all the time with other contractors, is failing to narrow the field of options available to you and to only offer the customer the options that you are expert in. All too often, contractors meet with customers and open Pandora's box to all of the variable capacity heat pump options available. This fail is epic both in its frequency of occurrence and in the consequences that can result. I mean, who can be expert in everything, right? Success in heat pump contracting includes living by this saying, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. So instead of opening Pandora's box, find several go-to heat pump products and applications and focus on those. This way, you will be installing products that you know work and which you know you can make money on. But be prepared to say no. There will come a time when a customer will ask you for a type of heat pump that you are not interested in installing. For example, at my company, years ago, we decided not to install ceiling-recessed ductless-style indoor units. These are the indoor units that blow in multiple directions at once and which are installed in the ceiling. Homeowners seem enamored by them because at first they appear less visually disruptive than wall-mounted styles. After installing several ceiling recessed types, we found that they produced much less occupant comfort and people were not as happy with them. Also, we made less money on the installation of them, and they were a headache for our installation operation. So when we decided not to offer them any longer, we trained our salespeople on how to handle the customer questions about them so that they could be prepared to educate the customer and hopefully move them over to the style of indoor unit that we could support. And it worked. Basically, when asked to install a type of heat pump that we'd have decided not to offer, we say to the customer the following. What if I told you that we could install what you're asking for, but this type of heat pump is not as energy efficient or quiet, and it doesn't produce the same amount of heat, and the installation would be thousands more dollars? Are you still interested in that type of heat pump? Invariably, they say, no, we want the other kind of heat pump that you recommend. So don't open Pandora's box. Instead, limit the types and styles of heat pumps to those which you are expert in and learn to educate the customer on the choices that you offer. Fail number three is what I call applying one big heat pump. This fail happens when you apply one big central system heat pump instead of several smaller heat pumps. If you are used to selling in older homes and designing around gas furnaces and ACs, you are probably used to installing one big powerful central system. As we mentioned before, heat pumps don't have the same power you are used to with gas furnaces. So don't fail to use what you have learned in this video. Try using multiple heat pumps or incorporating secondary heating sources into your design. I have found that homeowners are totally open to using a second system. They see it for what it is, 
a practical means of getting more heating and cooling into the structure. I have found that most homeowners are willing to pay for more, and they see two heat pumps as more. And given that modern variable capacity heat pumps are compact yet quiet, you don't have to worry about impacting the outdoor space by installing a second system. Fail number four is what I call bigger is better. This fail typically occurs when you get scared and sell more heating and cooling capacity than is needed. Trust your load calculation. I have talked with researchers who have data that shows how ACA Manual J calculations overestimate the heating and cooling load. In other words, just in case is already built into the software. So if your load calculation calls for a 38,000 BTU heating requirement, don't be afraid to pick equipment that meets the load or even produces slightly less than the load requirement. I realize you are used to picking furnaces that produce more than the calculated heating load, but when designing around variable capacity heat pumps, it is best to break yourself of this habit. Fail number five is what I call too many heads. This fail commonly occurs when converting a home to a modern variable capacity heat pump using ductless style indoor units. For contractors who are new to the technology, it's typical to use too many indoor units for the job. It's easy to do when you consider that, as heating and air conditioning contractors, we are used to having registers and grills all over the home. This way, we can spread the system air across lots of registers without any single grill becoming too loud. It also has the added benefit of washing the entire space with clean and conditioned air. With ductless style variable capacity heat pumps, we need much fewer discharge air locations. The reason why is because the variable capacity heat pump runs continuously at very low volumes. The air in the home is always being conditioned and circulated, which is really different than the on-off operation of the furnace and AC. For example, when I removed the gas furnace and AC from my home, I went all ductless. The downstairs floor is roughly 1,000 square feet. I removed six discharge air registers serving the downstairs and replaced them with two ductless style indoor units. It was a big change, but my home is so much more comfortable than it was previously. When I first considered converting my home, I thought I needed at least four ductless style indoor units to sweep the downstairs with conditioned air. A more experienced contractor friend advised me differently, and I am sure glad I took his advice. With fewer indoor units or heads, I have much more simple, lower cost, and effective installation. You know the saying, less is more. When designing a home's heating and cooling system using a ductless style variable capacity heat pump, it is very important to consider using less or fewer indoor units. This way, your installation will have less complicated pipe runs, use fewer, if any, condensate pumps, and make the system easier to use for the homeowner. I will share more cautionary tales related to this fail in the video dedicated to heat pump installation. As always, we have covered a lot. After hearing my many design tips and fails, I hope you feel like you can do this. Be sure to use the four-step heat pump design process and consider getting some training on load calculation and ductwork design if you have not already had this kind of training. And be sure to check out the other videos in this series. One last item will help you gain mastery quickly, and that is to install a heat pump or heat pump water heater in your own home. There is nothing like first-hand experience to help you leap ahead in expertise. And then you can say to a homeowner, at first I was unsure about heat pumps, but after I installed one in my own home, I was so satisfied. The comfort is truly exceptional and the low cost of operation is for real. If you've liked what you've heard in this video, 
please be sure to let us know by hitting the like button. And please consider reaching out to us with any comments or suggestions. Thanks for watching.